Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biaba Student Town Hall Live. My name is Latasha, and I'm a Biaba scientist. Today, we're exploring the intersection of art and science. Our marine biologist, Molly, will be in the field um, collecting samples, and we have a wonderful team of artists who will be creating art real time. Um, so I'm super excited. This is a wonderful collaboration between Biobus and GenSpace and Works on Water. So let's tell you a little bit about Biobus. Biobus is a nonprofit organization that works to make science accessible to all people, students alike can come, discover, and explore and pursue science. So now let's get down to introductions. Molly, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Molly Thurman, and I am a marine ecologist, and I work at Biobus. And I'm here today with my helper and fellow scientist. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> it's Maya, um, who is, who's helping me today in the field. Thank you. Carolyn? Hi, I'm Carolyn. I am also a marine ecologist, but a dancer and, a, and an interactive artist who loves talking about science to everyone. So I'm thrilled to be here with you on Biobus and we'll be doing some movement later. Awesome, okay. Simone? Hi everyone, my name is Simone Johnson. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist, researcher and cultural worker. And um, I'm excited to share some storytelling later on. Awesome, thank you. Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Cameron Sunda and I am also an interdisciplinary artist and I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about my work that I um, make with the water. I'm excited to chat with you. Awesome, thanks so much. All right, so let's get this party started. Uh, Molly, take it away. All right, so I'm so excited to, to kick off this uh, town hall this week, our final for the, for the academic year. And so I decided that we would do that by coming to the beach um, where I am up in Massachusetts and getting some creatures and actually showing you where we collect them from. And then a little later on, I'm gonna bring them back up to my laboratory and have them on the microscope so we can investigate them closer. And so today, um, Maya and I have been finding all sorts of things. What did you find, Maya? Clamma just put his belly out. Oh my goodness. So we're finding all sorts of mussels and clams today. We're standing at a sandy beach where um, at the moment, we're at about the middle um, between low tide and high tide. So every single day, um, the water comes in and out. And so it exposes either a completely sandy beach or sometimes we just have rocks like this. And something really special about this habitat is that it makes little pockets of water where um, different kinds of creatures can collect and they live there and almost like a pool. What do we call those, Maya? Tide pool. Tide pools. So we can come in and take a closer look at one of these tide pools. So for part of the day, these tide pools are completely underwater. The ocean is entirely up above where the rocks are. But right about now, all that's left is a little bit of water and you can see inside are all of these snails and algae. And what's that one? A mussel. Shrimp? Um, probably, yep, we see shrimp and all sorts of things in these. I just and found a shrimp. <laughs> you just found a shrimp? He's oh looking my goodness. At Where is it? Right there. Hiding in between the rocks. Do you, wanna, do you wanna get him? So Maya and I, yes Maya, we have been collecting all of the different creatures we can um, so that we can look at them closer. And this is a part of a marine biologist's job a lot of the time is to go to what we call the field. Oh, I see it too. So that, we go to the field one. Look. and we collect. Do you see him? He's right there. Oh, my. And also there's one right there. Wow. We collect um, living things and then we look at them very closely to try to determine 
what species they are. Is there another one? You can try to get it. Oh, it's there. Oh, no, let me go back. I think it's the same thing. Um, and one of the reasons I like looking in tide pools for creatures is because they oh. make <laughs> they make a um, protected habitat that's also easy for us to peer inside of. We don't have to go out in a boat and we don't have to use a net in order to observe all the different creatures living together in this little pocket of water. I also really like studying things, we call this in the intertidal between the low and the high tide, <laughs> because imagine if you had to live half of every day um, in the air and half of every day um, underwater, or if something really radical about your environment changed. And that's how it feels to be something like a periwinkle, where when the tide is high, they're completely covered with water and there's things like fish and lobsters and crabs crawling around them. And then at low tide, they have to hold on to the rocks and try to find ways that they don't dry up so that they can survive. So I find this is one of the most interesting places to study. And now if we quickly walk across the beach to where I've got some more samples, I'll show you one of the most exciting things we found today. And then we're going to let you think about how to make some art about that creature. Okay, come with me this way. As we walk on the beach, one thing that we notice is that there are holes all in the sand and sometimes they spout water at us because when we're at mid tide or low tide, the clams have collected water um, in the holes that they've dug and they're trying to spit it out at us. You can also notice out in the water that there's a, a hunter at work. So there's something floating on the surface and every now and then it takes a dive to see if it can collect some of the same organisms that we do today or it's in it. On the side of our container, you can see some of the creatures we've already collected, like snails and mussels. Do we have any um, any questions, Latasha, that are coming in so far that I can answer while we finish our walk? Um, that's, uh, I wanna introduce, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Beth. Um, she is from GenSpace, and she'll be answering all of your questions from the chat. You want to introduce yourself, Beth? Hello, everyone. I'm Beth from GenSpace. Happy to be here with you. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in just yet, so I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. So the, the last creature that I want to show you, we found in these special rocks over here that are completely covered in seaweed. And they make a great habitat for all sorts of things. Um, Molly, your your video let, went out. Sorry. Oh no. And we have a couple questions from the audience now too. Camila asks, how often do you discover discover a new marine life that you haven't seen before or oh, something that you didn't know about and you've been studying it? That's a great question. Um, so me personally, I find things all the time that are unfamiliar to me. It's really hard for a single person to know every single creature that might live in even a single habitat. Um, so today, for example, we found um, a kind of animal that I've seen before, but I don't know its exact species. It's this bright orange. It almost looks like a shrimp. So I'll show you an example. So I'm I really like that about my job that I'm often finding things that I have to learn about. Um, however, we have found at Biobus a creature that no one knew lived in New York City. And that was an exciting discovery for us. It was something that had been observed in other parts of the world, but not something that we had seen in the waters around New York. So that's, that's something that happens um, in a lab like this, you know, maybe every couple of years you might make a discovery like that. Um, today on the beach, our most exciting and I'd say charismatic animal that we found 
is this hermit crab. And so this is a creature that has a really fun adaptation. It takes the shells of periwinkles after they've died and it sticks part of its body um, into the periwinkle shell. And that way it can, it can protect itself if there's a bigger animal. And so it hides inside the shell when it's threatened and it comes out when it's trying to eat, or in this case, maybe trying to escape or fight <laughs> my thumb. <laughs> so it's got, this is a, is a little hermit crab. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take all of these different things that I've collected from the beach today and I'm gonna walk up to where I have my laboratory and a microscope so that we can look at them even closer all together. While you're mo walking, Molly, somebody else asked if you'd ever seen a live octopus. Have you ever found an octopus in the tide pool? Oh my goodness. I've never found an octopus. Um, I've found um, squid before but never an octopus. Um, but I should say I only work in like the, the, I've only worked as a marine biologist in the Northeast where we don't usually find things like octopi. Um, I would love to see that. Um, I'm gonna just take this, thank you very much. And um, if there's any more questions, I'm gonna turn off my camera, but I can still hear them. You're getting a lot of, that's cool and that's amazing. So thank you, Molly. <laughs> Great, I'm so happy. Oh, here we go. Milo asks, have you ever found any dangerous animals? Excellent question, Milo. Um, so the, the things that are, um, I've never found anything in the water that I was worried for my, my health from um, that, that were, that were animals. The thing that I'm most nervous about, especially in New York city are much, much smaller things like bacteria. So there are some things after big rainstorms that can get in the water that can make us sick. And so those sorts of things, um, I have found before, and I'm pretty careful about making sure I, um, if I, if I get the water anywhere near my face or in my eyes or things like that, if there's been a big rainstorm, um, that's probably the most dangerous, but I have found um, jellyfish. I've been stung by jellyfish before. I've been pinched by crabs and things like that, but nothing that, um, that ever did any, any serious harm. Oh, have you ever found a cone snail or a lionfish? I've never found a cone snail, but I have, um, I have seen a lionfish before, not anywhere not anywhere near New York, um, but I was snorkeling once and I saw a lionfish, which was really, um, I guess that qualifies as something kind of dangerous, but it, I didn't see it while I was, while I was in New York. Um, but they're really spectacular to see. Okay, thank you so much, Molly. That was fun. I think we uh, we we're, we're excited to see those late those uh, samples later under the microscope. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited to show you. Okay, so we're gonna go over to Carolyn. So I'm ready for to figure out like what do you have in store for us? Yeah. So we're gonna now go to gallery view, so all of the other artists can come on uh, video because Carolyn is gonna lead us into an. A wonderful exercise. Yeah, so Molly shared some pretty great creatures with us that she found, a clam, shrimp, periwinkle, little periwinkle snail, a mussel, and a hermit crab. And I'm curious what your favorite is of what she showed us. And you guys can write that into the chat. Um, my favorite today is the hermit crab. And I think you saw when Molly was holding it up, it could pull its legs in or it could push its legs out. And one of the ways I like to learn about um, the creatures that I'm looking at either for art or for science is to, it's to feel how they move, to feel how they live at their water's edge. And so let's, let's all try that. Let's all pull our legs in really tight. If we pull them in really tight, we're in our shell, our, our borrowed shell. And then, okay, we're feeling better. We're gonna put them out, right? And so we're putting them out. How do, how do the hermit crabs walk? How do you think they walk? Let's try that. 
They might reach forward and pull the sand with one side than the other, but you know what? They can go backwards too. So then you can push yourself backwards. Oh wait, something just scared you. You're in your shell. Now you feel like fighting them a bit. You're fighting another hermit crab. Maybe you want their shell. Okay, now the cool thing about her, one of the many cool things about hermit crabs is that they have to change their shells as they grow. So I want you, wherever you are, to sort of look around and see if there is a shell or a space that you can fit in perfectly. Maybe it's under your table. Maybe it's under your chair. Maybe it's under a pillow. But take a minute, try something. I'm gonna disappear under my table for a second. Did you find a space that fit you? Right, so hermit crabs have to keep looking for spaces to, that, that fit as they grow. And the other thing that hermit crabs can, can do that's really cool is they can either flow with the tide or they can find a place to, help, to hold still. So let's see what it feels like to be a little hermit crab, allowing the tide to sort of scoot you along. If the tide comes in, you might go all the way to one side and then maybe you grab at the sand a little bit and then the tide is going out and you're gonna flow to the other side and you're gonna grab at the sand a little bit to stop you. And if you don't wanna move, like if you're in that rocky area that Molly and Maya were in, what do you think you can do to, to keep yourself in one place? So the tide is coming. Yes, you could put those legs out. And where's a place where the tide won't move you as much? What do you think? Maybe in a little crevice in between some rocks. So you're gonna put yourself in a little tight crevice and hold yourself down so that the tide comes and you just barely move. And then you can come out when you're exposed to the air again or when the water is calm and you're in a nice little tide pool. Or, you can dig a hole in the sand and hide. Let's all dig a hole in the sand and hide. And then let's come back out. So for the next 30 seconds, move the favorite way you wanna move as a hermit crab. Of all the things we did, what was your favorite way to move? I think I'm gonna flow with the tide. Oh, you guys look great. Love all those hermit crab legs. Oh, there goes Sarah finding a new place to hide. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. Oh, I'm go with the tide again. I'm so curious what some of your other favorite animals are. Welcome back, Sarah, the hermit crab is back in. <laughs> And I invite you all to choose some of the other animals that we were talking about and to try to be them at home with your friends or some of the great ones you guys mentioned. You mentioned lionfish, you mentioned octopus, and there were jellyfish, any of the conefish or cone, cone, cone snails, I think. Whichever ones you think are the best, I invite you to try those out, look them up and find out how they move. And that's a way by learning how they move at the water's edge, you actually learn a lot about the creatures and then you can sort of think creatively about them in a new way. Thanks for doing that with me. Awesome, thank you, Carolyn. Um, Beth, do we have any um, things from the chat? Yeah, it seems like people are definitely playing along. Somebody imagines that their tooth lots of zeros meters digging down and someone else is saying that they're going to disappear under their body and they're going to disappear under their tight bed. So there's lots of uh, people playing and engaging, floating with the tide. Someone's going to dig into somebody else's hole. <laughs> so lots of, lots of engagement uh, in the chat. That's wonderful. You know, one of the really cool things that I learned about hermit crabs is that once they choose a shell, it's really hard to get them out. They squeeze the soft part of their body deep in the shell, 
so that you can't, even if they have their legs out, it's really hard to pull them out. So they really own that shell. So when you get under that bed or under that chair, or if you get in someone else's shell, you hold on, <laughs> don't let go. Okay, all right, thank you. That was really great. All right, um, Simone. Let's hear it. Let's hear the story that you got for us. I love that. Thank you, Carolyn. I love being a hermit crab in the water. Um, I'm going to share a story about a hermit crab, and I may be looking down at my notes because I, I just wrote this story today. Um, but I wanted to tell you first about one of my favorite stories. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Moon, Guardian of the Moon, which is an animation where there is the, the world of day and the world of night. And um, there's this girl who comes from both day and night. And some, suddenly something happens to the sun. And because something happens to the sun, it affects day and night. And it's just such a wonderful movie, a wonderful imaginative story. And I thought about experimenting and playing around with, you know, how do you write fictional stories, stories that are made up but you include informa actual information about the hermit crab or your observations about the hermit crab in this fictional story. And I feel like stories can make people excited. You know, there's mystery, there's adventure. So I would love to share my story about a hermit crab. Um, I included information um, from a web page that Molly sent. I'm gonna actually pull it up here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so I'm going to just have this up while I read the story. And um, if I put a link in the chat, but I'll, there's a lot of information from this page that I, I've included in this story. For example, how hermit crabs like to eat algae. So be on the lookout for that. All right, here we go. Long Claw Shallow Water Lisa is a hermit crab who lives in a place called the Lower Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. Long Claw hermit crabs usually live in shallow water and this is indeed what Long Claw Lisa calls home. Lisa is on a mission. She needs to find a shell. Not just any shell though, but one her great grandma left her. It's a pretty special shell. Apparently, it has a map sketched into it. Except Lisa doesn't know what the map shows or even if the shell with the map is real. Hermit crabs don't usually have shells, so they will use an empty one that originally, originally belonged to another animal, such as a snail, periwinkle, or oyster drill. Lisa's uncle said the shell with the map originally came from a periwinkle living on Rock Valley. But Grandma Sally says the shell came from a moon snail who had traveled all over the lower Chesapeake Bay. A well-traveled moon snail, she would say. Moon snails are the largest living marine snails. And as moon snails do, this one got around gliding on a body part called a foot, which when fully extended can be about 12 inches long. I'd say that's pretty long. I don't care what you say, Pete, said Grandma Sally to Lisa's uncle. That map came from a moon snail. I'm sure of it. Well, long claw shallow water Lisa hasn't had any luck finding a shell to borrow lately, let alone the shell with the map. She has so many questions for her family and great grandmother about this mysterious shell map. What's on this map? Why did her great grandmother want to pass down the shell to her? Where is it? Why doesn't anyone in the family know where the shell is? It was frustrating and didn't make any sense. It didn't help that Lisa has also been feeling down about it all, but she knows she must persist. That's what you do a lot of times when you live on the edge. The next morning, Long Claw, shallow water Lisa woke up with renewed determination to find the shell. While, while out eating algae for breakfast, because hermit crabs love to eat algae, Longclaw Lisa suddenly 
Now I want to, I'm asking you to finish the story. So if you want to finish the story, you can put a few words, you can put a sentence in the, in the YouTube chat. And you know, this could be something you could do later on where maybe you're writing a story, but you include information like what's on this web page, or maybe you're observing some marine creatures and you include some observations. And I, I just wanted to share that story. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I encourage you to play around with writing stories also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. We're, we're gonna finish. I invite everybody to put some stuff in the chat um, to finish that up. And now we're gonna go back to Molly. Sorry, Molly, we can't hear you. So Bali is getting her set up right now. And um, so I wonder if there's some, Beth, Beth, is there some cool things in the chat that you wanna tell us that's going on while Molly's getting her, her set up correct? <laughs> All right. All right, then um, you know what I can do? We talked yeah. about a moon snail. I can show everyone a picture of a moon snail. That sounds good. All right, let me let me get that moon snail up. All right. You guys ready to see what that 12 inch foot looks like? Here we go. That is a moon snail. Okay, you won't be able to hear otherwise. Ah, oh, we can hear you now, Molly. We're just showing the moon snail. Ah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize it unmuted me. Hi, everybody. We're back. We got our headphones set up. Can you all hear me now? Awesome. Okay, great. Um, the moon snail, thank you for showing that. So that was another thing that we've been finding on the beach a lot lately. Today, we mostly found um, periwinkles. But what and I'm gonna normal snail. and some yeah so some some normal some common periwinkles and they've all made their way to the top of my container. So what that means is I can really easily take off the lid and there's one right there in the corner. Yes, go ahead, Maya. What are they? The little tiny um, snails. And when we found one of them, two one was yellow and the other was normal colored and they're stuck to each other. Exactly, right. They were right on top of each other. So one snail on top of another snail and it was pretty amazing. And so now I can see it's actually moving all the way across the lid. I can watch it move. Um, but it's so small that looking at it just with our eyes isn't as fun as using a microscope. So right next to me, I'll show you quickly. We've got a setup here for a microscope, but more importantly, the microscope has a camera and that means that I can just give you all microscope vision. And you'll be able to see this snail really closely. So I'm gonna switch over now to microscope vision and you'll get to see what we're seeing. All right. I got it a little bit zoomed in. Thank you, Maya. I think right now I'm noticing that it's not showing up. Can anybody see what's going on in the microscope on their screen? This is a big part of science. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Science sometimes means that we have to troubleshoot things. So right now what I'm doing is trying to test what part of my setup is not working perfectly. And in a moment, Hopefully, we'll determine which one it is. Aha! And we'll be able to fix it. So, for all of you following along, we have our tiny periwinkle on the microscope. And I'm just about to make it so we can all look at it up close. So, there's its shell. 
And if we look carefully, we might just see its tiny little face peeking out from the edge. So I notice there are these little black dots on the side of its head. Maya, do you have any guesses about what that could be? That's just an eyes. Yeah. They have antennas to feel where they're, where, where they're going to touch everywhere. And they, use, they also have eyes, but they don't see very good. Yeah, that's exactly right. So right now I can see it's waving its antennas around. That's how it's kind of figuring out where it wants to go. And it's also poking its head out every now and then so that its eyes can see its surroundings. And that big kind of tan shape underneath it that looks slimy, we that's call that- It's foot. It's foot, exactly. It's foot. And that's how it um, can stick to different surfaces. We often think of snails as being able to, um, to be kind of stuck to things and that's how they do it. They've got mucus, like the mucus in your nose, but they use mucus for different things. They use it for, um, for traveling around. Okay, I'm gonna take, oh, I have someone trying to escape, another periwinkle trying to get out. But I'm gonna take our friend that we found on the beach, our hermit crab, and I'm gonna put that onto the microscope and see if we can see it. The hermit crab is a bit bigger. So right now, we can only see one part of its body at a time. So the part we just had on the microscope for a second. What did it say? Exactly. And we knew that it had some tiny little eyes. Oh. I noticed that it's kind of trying to avoid the light a little bit. Maya, what do you think's going on there? He doesn't like the light because he only likes darkness because he lives in the seaweed where it's dark and doesn't like light because it hurts his eyes. I think that's a really good hypothesis. So they've got that shell and it allows them to kind of hide if it gets too bright. Oh, there we go. If I'm really delicate, there's something on my hand. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh my goodness. Um, so we can see really carefully. Oh, there's its pincher. And all over our hermit crab's body are tiny, tiny other little animals. I can see there's like these, they almost look like hairs, but it's got things living on its shell all around it, um, on its exoskeleton. So that's a reminder that even some of the smallest creatures can have creatures living on them which is pretty incredible. One thing I also noticed when we were at the beach, and I'm gonna see if I, can, if I can hold our hermit crab still for a second so we can look at it, is that on its shell, I could see the evidence of how the original snail that was in this shell may have met its end, which is that there's a hole. a hole. Because a kind of snail called a dog snail, they drill holes in snails to get out the juice with their tongue, their very sharp tongue. It's like a drill and they take it out and now the hermit crab can live in it even if it has a, a hole in it. Very nice, Maya, exactly. So something, and I think it was either, maybe like you said, it could have been a dog, a dog whelk, that kind of snail, or in this case, maybe even a moon snail, drilled a hole to eat this, the periwinkle and then it left behind the shell that our friend, the hermit crab, could move into. So you can see really clearly. And what's kind of cool is if I just keep it on the hole for a second, you can see the part of the hermit crab's body that's on the inside of the shell moving around as it tries to move in and out. So I'm gonna keep it still so that while it calms down, it might try to move around inside. That's his belly. <laughs> yeah, maybe his belly or his leg or something going on there. Oh, there it goes. So now I can actually feel it crawling around on my finger. That was his leg, <laughs> leg in the, there. Exactly. Thank you, Maya. I'm also going to put under the microscope um, some of the, yeah, we've got some algae. Some clams. And we've got some, yeah, we've got some things like clams and mussels. So um, while I'm putting the sample on, I don't know if there's any recommend, if there's any requests from people who are following along with our 
town hall today of things that they want to see from the beach. Um, but I'm going to put, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to put some seaweed just right on the center. And I see something that's crawling around on there. Let's see if we can get it up. We found an amphipod that has a little amphipod that he's holding, a baby amphipod in his hands, too. He's swimming around with it. Oh, my goodness. Excellent. Excellent description, Maya. I don't know if we can catch it. It's moving around very quickly, so I might have to put it on something with a little bit less water, but you can see that green color is the is this this algae. We actually have a good name for that, which which I think makes sense. Yes, that's fine, Maya. Um, which which makes sense for for um, something that it reminds me of. We call it sea lettuce. So sea lettuce is um, that green algae that we were just looking at a second ago. So here's one of our amphipods. I think the other one might have fallen. So Maya, I'm going to have you on amphipod recovery duty. Okay, I'll look at them. Thank you. I think you want some baby back. Yeah, but here's our baby amphipod. So this is a special kind of creature. They're related to our hermit crab, um, but they are, um, <laughs> that what, we, what we're more, what we call them more regularly is um, a type of plankton. So it's something, oh, did my video freeze? I think it did. Okay, okay. can you see it again? Uh, I think he's dead. <laughs> I think it's playing dead. Okay. Let's see if we can get it. Okay. Um, so these amphipods are really special crustaceans because um, of the way they, they move around. They can actually get across the beach even at low tide they can kind of crawl and hop. So sometimes people even um, get to know these creatures because they see something kind of jumping up at their feet as they walk across the, the sand on the beach. And that's most likely a little amphipod. I one time had one on my foot. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people even call them sand fleas, um, which makes sense because they jump just, just like those, but they're a bit bigger than a flea. It kind of hurts when they go on your foot because it feels like something's biting your foot when it's ticklish because you don't know that something's on your foot so it feels like it's poking you. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes the surprise of having one of these jump on your foot uh, makes you think that it bit you and you got hurt, but actually it's just surprise. Um, so I'm going to turn back my other camera on. Oh, yes, thank you. And I'll show you what the situation over here that Maya was, was telling me about. There are snails just escaping, escaping this container. This one in particular is really making a break for it. Um, yes, you can take that off. Thank you, Maya. Can I stay, can I stay here? <laughs> um, no, Maya, it's okay. Um, so I've got, um, I've got a few more creatures if people wanna see them um, or, we can, or we can chat about some of the ones that we've already looked at. Um, but, but I'm curious to hear from all of you what you, what you want to do with this microscope and this, these samples. Let's take yeah. some questions from the chat. Yeah, Milo asked what was moving really fast on the shrimp's belly. Oh, great question. So we saw on the, the amphipod, that shrimp-like creature, there's something that kind of looked like it was waving really quickly. Um, and those are, interestingly, those are its legs. So its legs are protected by part of its shell. And it moves its legs like that because um, that's how it actually is able to, to move water across its gills. So if it's in a situation where it feels like there's not a lot, it needs oxygen, um, it'll sometimes move its legs to see if it can get fresh water, or not fresh, but salt water <laughs> across across its gills. In this situation, that doesn't work very well. Um, it could also just be trying to escape, but that's one thing that they move their legs for. Um, but great question. And then we have a lot of requests for more creatures and more animals. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll put on we'll put on some new ones. Um, I'll let Maya pick one this time. Do you see any that you want to look at, Maya? 
There was one question about what happens when the hermit crabs can't find a shell? Are they vulnerable to predators? And if so, what do they do to hide themselves? That's a great question. We saw um, very recently at the beach, we saw what they do when they get too big for their shells, which is kind of cool. They form like, they have like a little hermit crab party. Um, when, when there's a new shell that like gets emptied because the snail dies, they all huddle around it. And then eventually they'll kind of form a line so that each hermit crab moves up the size. And they keep taking turns using the, the shell to see which, if the, sh the shell, if it fits whatever, they see, they see if they have a fight to see who fits in the shell. So whoever fits in the shell and wins the fight, they get the shell. Exactly. Right. So they get to kind of uh, battle it out. So the strongest crab and the, and the crab that fits in the shell gets to keep it, which means that they only leave their shells like that if another shell is available. Because when they, they do that whole behavior, when a new shell shows up. Um, I guess there's maybe if it got separated somehow, like it got pulled out by a predator, uh, it would be pretty vulnerable until it found a new one. So I don't know what it would do, but that I've never seen that um, out in the wild before. They, they normally only come out of their shells if they're right next to another empty one. That's, that's sort of how they avoid that problem. Great question. Okay, I've got um, a muscle that Maya picked out for us, a blue mussel. So I'll see if I can get the microscope camera back on. It's not blue, that is that is a very good observation. What color would you call this, Maya? It, that is the, the name of the species. It's black and on the tip of it, it's brownish white. That's right, so it's got kind of a few different colors going on. Um, Except some, some mussels have a black around them, then white and then blue in the middle. That's right, they have different colors. It's right, they're all kind of in the same color family, but this one is, um, I would agree, kind of black and brown and white, but a little bit of a blue tint. Now, looking at a mussel is a little bit hard on the microscope because most of the animals on the inside of its shell, so we're basically just looking at the texture of the outside of its shell and not able to see like its organs or the other parts of its body. But if I were to open the shell, um, I would see that there's a, a whole animal and it even has like a, a heart that can beat and it's got, oh, I see some things that might've gotten stuck, some little sand grains maybe that got stuck to the outside. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, muscles shoot up water because when, when, the t when they hear the tide, they shoot up the water so they can get fresh water in. So when the other, when the tide goes out, they have fresh water in, and they spit out the the water that is dirty and not not the good water. They get new water. Right. So when the when the water covers them up, they'll actually open their shells up a little bit, and they can change the water that's inside. And just like we saw before, the amphipod. That's also how they can make sure they get enough oxygen. Because even though they're underwater, they need oxygen that's in the water. And they have protection that they have little strings of thread that sticks to the rock that they're on. So then if a seagull comes or a bird that would like to eat them comes and tries to get them, it makes them a little bit safe because they're stuck to the rock and that's they can't pull it off. Exactly right, that's exactly right. I see one more thing that I'm gonna pull out of here. I'm actually going to Can I ask you a couple question. more questions, Molly, before you move oh, on? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it looks like there is some debate about why it's called a blue muscle versus a oh. black, white, brown muscle that's named blue. Um, and somebody, yeah. So do you want to start with that one? And then there's two more. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there a specific question or is it just more people want just to wanted to know why is it named blue? <laughs> you know what in the light you can actually see they do have they're like very dark navy blue they're a little bit iridescent now we're looking at a different thing on the microscope which I'll describe <laughs> in a second but um they're bugs that float on the top of the water exactly yeah. yeah um they they were we found them floating and actually when I put them in the dish they all left the water so now they're just crawling around but they're pretty mm -hmm. cute um but the but the mussels they 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 do have 
um, if you see them outside, they might look black at first, but they do have kind of like a, a, a bit of a blue undertone, or I'd say kind of like iridescent, shiny color to them. Um, so that's, that's I, I think, I could be wrong. It's possible there's another marine biologist listening to this and they're like, that's not why we call them that. <laughs> <laughs> they also asked what kind of predators do they have? Blue mussels? Oh, yes. that's a really good question. Maya, can you think of a predator of a blue mussel? A blue mussel predator is a dog. Yeah, dog whelk. That's a good one. Yeah. Dog whelk and seagulls. Seagulls, sea stars, actually, like starfish. They eat, how they eat is they, their belly comes out and they take, they first open it a little bit, then their belly comes out and that's how they eat. They just put their belly inside the clam and suck out the juice. And then they close the belly comes back into their body. Yeah, exactly right. So they so there's all sorts of things that eat <laughs> blue mussels in all different ways. So a, a a a bird might drop it on the rock so that it smashes open and then eat what they find. A starfish or uh or uh might might actually open the shell with its muscles and then um stick its stomach inside or, or digest it in its shell using chemicals. And then a, a dog whelk or a moon snail might actually drill a hole in its shell and then eat what's inside. So all different things you have to be afraid of if you're a, a mussel or a clam on the beach. It's a hard world. Um, these little guys are very cute. I don't know. Yeah. They want to know what they are. They would be considered. <laughs> I don't think they're, I don't know if they're insects or crustaceans. And they have two littler ones that are baby with them. Yeah, they're really cute. I can't, I can't not see that. It's adorable. I have oh. little bugs that are very vague on them and they're robots. <laughs> yeah, right. You do. Yeah, there's some toys that look just like this. So I think these might, I can't tell how many legs they have. So one way that I can tell the difference between things like insects and things like uh, crustaceans is the number of legs. It looks like they have six and then two antennas. So I think they might be insects, but... Again, they don't have the, like a, a thorax and an abdomen. So I don't know. This is a mystery. We'll have to look into what, what the identity of these are. I see them all the time. They float on the surface of little tide pools. Um, so um, yeah, I think, I think we, I don't know. Latasha, do we have time for one more creature or is there, are there other things that, um, that we want to share with everybody today? <laughs> I think um, there is a couple more things that we want to share. Um, okay, great. Um, but you know, um, and and um, and then, but we be prepared to call on you in the end. <laughs> we may okay. go back to you at the end. Okay, sounds right. good. We'll we'll okay. be ready. We'll mute. We'll mute, and we'll be ready to answer questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so Beth, um, is is um, do we have any any stories that the in the chat from Simone's endings of Simone's stories that we want to share out yeah we can share those stories absolutely so we had um Charlize said that suddenly the creature was pushed off a rock um and then Ahosh also said that someone was pushed off a cliff <laughs> yeah. but Camila says that they come suddenly came across a shell and it fit perfectly and Mayuki says that suddenly she trips over the shell and breaks her neck and dies and the end. <laughs> and Lisa saw a beautiful shell tucked in a rock crevice. She scuttled towards it. She peeked inside and found some fine lines that apparently made a map. And then let's see. Um, Christian says that she got, she got, so she gets a lobster she gets in the claws of a lobster. The lobster begins to, begins to eat her and she died. So there were a lot of uh, death stories about this sweet little crab. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. So we have Sarah, you're up next. All right, hello everyone. Um, I am going to be sharing a little bit with you. So I, so, 
In my work, I like to think about the tides um, and myself as a human species living at the tides and living on the edge. And so I have a project that I've been working on over the last not, uh, eight years, since 2013. Um, it was triggered by Hurricane Sandy hitting New York City. And um, where I stand in a tidal area starting at low tide and I let the water rise up to my chin and then I let it go all the way back down again over the course of about 12 to 13 hours. So when Molly was showing us some of the critters at the, that live in the tides, I was thinking, wow, that's kind of like what I like to do. Um, and part of that is really about trying to let myself um, embody the water and embody what it means to be um, an animal species and trying to feel something different, trying to feel the water as my kin, as my relative. So I'm going to show you a video, maybe two, um, to share this with you, share this work with you, and I'm just going to let you watch it. Here we go. Oh. All right. So that was me in the red dress, and um, many people came to join me standing in the water. That was 12 hours and 46 minutes, and it took place in the North Sea in the Netherlands. And um, since then, I've also performed this work in Bangladesh and Brazil and Kenya. And I will be doing it next year in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is actually, this is a shot, a photo from the um, where I'll stand in Aotearoa. And then I will be in New York City. And you are all invited to come and stand with me if you'd like. Um, I also invite you to, um, next time you're at the water's edge, if you're able to get there, um, just stand for a little while and feel what it is like to, to have the water rise slowly on your body if you can if you can handle it i encourage you to do that um all right oh latasha says we have time to show the next video so here we go i'm going to show you the time lapse from kenya so what you're seeing here is 12 hours and 16 minutes boiled down into two minutes all right here we go oh wait sorry wrong one hold on I didn't, there we go, okay.
just gonna mention that you can see the little movement here. Those are little crabs at the water's edge. Just one last thing that I want to mention is that you can see how um, how much the community plays a role in these artworks. And um, it's so important, I think, when we're working at the waterfront as artists to be listening to what everyone who lives near there has to say. And one thing I want to mention, too, is that um, Carolyn and I all work with Works on Water. We are an uh, artist-run organization um, that makes art that happens on, in, and with the water, in collaboration with the water. And right now we are um, doing a project with the Department of City Planning and we are asking for feedback uh, to the City of Waterfront Plan. And we're going to put a link in the chat um, and we really encourage you to check this out today. And if you have feedback, if you have thoughts on, um, on what you think needs to happen at the waterfront, I really encourage you, we all encourage you to it's submit so your lovely. feedback because the, um, the the Department of City Planning really needs to hear from folks like you and, um, and all perspectives around the city. And so I'm gonna be submitting my feedback in a little bit and I hope you will too. All right, that's it. Over to you, Latasha. Thank you Thank guys, you guys so, so much. much. Um, so. Um, um, this is our last town hall of the season, and I am inviting you guys to go back and look at more of the works that all of these wonderful artists have. And I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. And you can definitely do more science with Biobus. So there are... Go explore at home science challenges and past student town halls that you can go see and we'll come back in the fall with more town halls more challenges but in the meantime go to biobus.org see what we're doing follow us on social media at biobus.org and join me in thanking our scientists and artists for being amazing thank you guys for everything and see you next time Thank you, Latasha. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Beth and Danny. Great to share alongside Thank Sarah. Thank you. Is she leaving?